morning. Glad you're here. We kind of we kind of rotated. The, the crew that was gone last week is back, but now the crew that was here last week left. So uh, we've got a lot of people traveling. We have some families that are sick this morning, so be praying for them. I always mention that, and I'll mention a couple of specifics uh, during the announcement time. But go ahead and stand. I'm glad you're here this morning. We'll sing this chorus together. Lord, let us weep again. Let America weep. That's what we need, honestly, if we're going to get back to being right with God, right? Uh, God has to break our hearts, and we have to be willing to have our hearts broken by the Lord. Uh, David said in Psalm 51, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Isn't that right? Lord, let us weep again. That's what we need. Let's sing it out nice and loud if you know it. Lord, let us weep again. Let America weep. that goes right along with that. Let revival begin in me. That's what we need, right? We need revival in this country. And if all we keep saying is we need revival, it's probably never going to happen. Let revival begin in me. That's a, that's, a, that's a prayer that we ought to all be praying together. Let revival begin in me. Let's sing it out nice and loud if you know it. We'll do this one through twice. Lord, send revival. Start the work in me. songbooks out we'll do another song together it's good singing all right good morning welcome to mount victory baptist church 653 in your hymnals will remain standing 653 i will sing of my redeemer and his wondrous love to me 653 we'll do all four verses on the first i will sing of my redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the the second when we get to that chorus I need some people singing them parts all right doesn't matter who it is I need somebody singing that bottom line I might sing it with you all right on the second I will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing or sing Me 
like you mean it. I'm the last. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his I'm glad you're here again this morning, and uh, a couple things I, I mentioned uh, earlier, but really three things that we really need to pray for. Um, uh, Brother JJ came back from Miami, and uh, some of his treatment, his treatments and things have gone pretty well, um, but he's still getting weaker, and that's, that's uh, obviously not a good thing. He has ALS, and uh, so the weaker you get, obviously, the more complications that happen and everything else. So they have some decisions that they have to make over the next few weeks, some pretty big decisions, so... Um, just pray for them um, and pray with them about that. And then uh, Brother Darrell was able to come home on, uh, what was that, Wednesday, Tuesday? Thursday. Thursday. So um, had his surgery, and uh, everything was successful, and uh, st number's still looking good. I didn't ask you, but okay. Yeah, yeah, going up on its own um, by the time he left the hospital, which is a good thing. So be praying for that. And uh, they got a biopsy sent off of his lymph nodes that were a little bit swollen, so we're waiting for the results back on that, too. So just be praying about that also. And then um, um, I told you there was three. Why can't I remember the third one? Somebody help me out. Oh, Kristen, that's right. That's right. Miss Kristen um, went into the hospital on Wednesday, I guess, and uh, just basically all paralyzed, like, waist up for the most part face lots of different just individual parts go ahead brother yeah yeah numb that's sorry yeah but can't find i haven't been able to figure out anything they don't know why it's happening and and you know she's been having these headaches for the last year and a half and just Probably all connected, but they can't figure anything out. So just be praying for that, especially. And then Miss Diana is gone this morning as well. Brother Bill uh, is staying, stayed home with her. She's just been having a, a real time with, uh, she had a colonoscopy to try to figure out what was going on and had some polyps removed and things, but it just, nothing has gotten better. So uh, intestine-wise, so just be praying for her with that as well. So uh, a lot of things to pray for. There's more on the list as well. Miss Barbara too, She's she's been having f five treatments now or six? Did you do your six? Five. So. And, and the tumors are shrinking and everything else, so that's good, but some complications a little bit with some of the medicines and things, too. So grab one of the prayer lists in the back if you, if you didn't get one on Wednesday, and uh, a lot of those are on there to help you remember to pray. So many things to pray for, and, uh, of course, it's, it's our responsibility of the church body to make sure that we're praying for each other, all right? So let's pray this morning. Father, we love you. Give me thank you so much for your goodness to us, and I do thank you for an opportunity to be here in your house. I thank you for the household of faith. I thank you for the family of God that we can be a part of. And God, I do pray for those in our family that are hurting, many that are going through difficulties that, that don't have answers and, and are still trying to figure things out. You know you're the great physician. You can heal them uh, with just a touch. And so I pray that you do that, God, and, and I pray that you comfort each one of these that we mentioned here this morning. Uh, I pray especially for Brother JJ. God, I thank you that uh, he was able to get some treatments, but I, I do pray for these decisions that they have to make. I pray that you give them wisdom as they do it and uh, others that are going through all these other things that we just mentioned. God, you, you know each of their situations. I pray that you would, uh, in your will, heal them, if it's your will. But uh, above all, God, that you, that you would be glorified through their lives because of it, and that they'd become stronger on the other side. When, when he had tried me, the Bible says, I shall come forth as gold. And I pray that each one of these would come out on the other side stronger than when they went in. And uh, I pray that you just give them the comfort as well. God, we're here because we need something from you. We need revival in our nations. We need revival in our church, in our churches. We need revival in our church. We need revival in our own individual lives. And so I pray that uh, as we're here this morning, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd use the message uh, in our lives in a, in a way that only the Holy Spirit can. And I pray, as we always do, that you'd be pleased by everything that happens here this morning. Thank you for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Well, go ahead and get your bulletins out. If you need one, raise your hand. We'll get the ushers to bring you one. There we go. I got a few things that we got to do this morning. And uh, a few things to uh, talk about. So we got a lot, a lot to do this morning. So I'm going to try to get through these as quickly as I can. I'm going to kind of hold off on some of the dates and everything else just because uh, you got all that there in front of you in the bulletin, which we'll get to in a second. But first thing we got to do is I got to give a presentation to Miss Neha. She finished book two in Forever Settled. So um, I, I, don't, I don't know how fast it, it, she got through it, but it's, it's about two years from start to finish if you go book one and then book two. But she already did book one and got, a, got a, uh, a commentary Bible, and some of you have done that as well. And so at the end of book two, you get a $25 gift certificate to uh, Christian Book Distributors, which basically you can go buy whatever you want. If you want another Bible, you can get that. Um, but it's easiest way to do it is to just send it to you. So she got that in an email, right? Nitin didn't steal it from you, did he? I sent it to his email, but I got this for you. And then, uh, and then a certificate of completion. Congratulations on your successful completion of For- Forever Settled, book two. So Miss Neha, if you'll come up here. My wife and I are on the last page, so we're getting close, and I know some of you others are as well, so she beat us to the end, so very good. And um, working on, I'm working on book three and four, actually, so hopefully by the time a, a majority of you get to, hey, there's so many verses in there, you could go back to the beginning and start over and probably not even remember that you memorized them, right? That's usually the way that it works, but um, uh, congratulations, Miss Neha. And we got some birthdays here. Eliana had a birthday on Wednesday, right? And Annalise, she must be out there with your wife, huh? She has a birthday tomorrow. So I got a, I got a birthday card for her because I, didn't, uh, I couldn't send a candy bar in the mail. And I didn't want to give her a sticker drum and do a couple of them off. So I'll, I'll send it to you. You can do that again. Well, we got to sing happy birthday. So let's sing happy birthday to Eliana. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Very good. Very good. Happy birthday. Uh, let, me, let me mention this before I go into a couple other things. I got this from Brother Craig, but uh, he's got some of those birdhouses out there still. And I know a lot of you have bought them, but he, he builds them, makes them for $20, and then all of the money uh, that he gets from the birdhouses goes directly into the building fund. So um, it's not too late to grab some more of those. He's got, a, he's got a few more of them out there. So pick those up before he takes them home. And uh, that's a reminder as well. Um, we are saving up money, and, and obviously we don't have a building yet. We don't have a we don't even have a situation yet that we can start, you know, specifically putting that money toward. But we're going to need it. And so um, a lot of you have been giving toward the building fund. We had a, we had the kind of the Christmas offering that we did this year toward the building fund, and it's growing, which is a good thing. But uh, just a reminder that you can put that in the offering plate um, if you want to every week, every month, whatever. Just as the Lord leads you to. Uh, to uh, give toward that building fund so that we can continue to raise the money that we're undoubtedly going to need when it's time to, to move. And I don't know when that's going to be yet. We still got a couple things in the works, but nothing that's really, no, no real promising leads yet. So keep praying about that. We, we definitely need to have a, a place that we can go um, when the time comes and they tell us, hey, you got 60 days or you got 20 minutes. I don't know what they're going to tell us, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll know that we know that the Lord is leading us and, and uh, wherever he wants us to go, he's already got that place set up. So uh, just just uh, keep praying about that. A couple other things that we have coming up. Of course, um, well, let me mention this. Sunday school at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. 11 o'clock is our, our morning service. And then evening service at 6 o'clock. We've been doing a series probably for the last year, year and a half. And it's just, it's, it's branched off into a couple of different sections. But uh, what, what I believe and why. And I say what I believe because I'm not telling you that this is what you have to believe. But I'm going to give you enough Bible verses that hopefully you'll come to the same conclusion at the end of it, all of it. But... I really would like you to make a special effort over the next couple of months to be here on Sunday nights. What we're going to be, what we're going to start, uh, especially if you work in any of the ministries, we're going to be making some gradual changes. I think our, I think our church is ready, but we're going to we're going to talk about standards and convictions. What are they? Why do we have them? What is what is a standard? What is a conviction? Um, what do they mean? So every church has a standard. Right? Every church has a standard set somewhere, and one of the things that, that traditionally, I suppose, has set 
Independent Fundamental Baptist Church is a part is that the standards are generally higher than they would be in, in other places. And that doesn't make, us, doesn't make us better than anybody else, but we want to be as close to the Word of God as we possibly can be. And when we find areas that we can improve in, when we see things in the Word of God that will help us, um, I believe we ought to at least make our best attempt to get there. And so we're going we're gonna to look specifically at the issue of standards when it comes to dress and modesty. Uh, why do we do the things that we do? And I know most of you have probably noticed that my wife only wears skirts. You know, there's other ladies that only wear skirts and dresses for everything. And maybe you wondered why. And obviously it's not something that I'm trying to force on anybody else or anything like that. But I believe that as a church, we're ready to take that step forward. And, and I want to explain it to you to, to help you understand those things. And again, there's a lot of things in the Word of God that are very important. And maybe this doesn't rise to the level of very important, but I think... I think if it's something that we can see in the Word of God and we can take that next step, then I believe we ought to. And so that's what we're going to start going over on, on Sunday nights. And I don't want you to miss the explanation behind why we're doing what we're doing. So um, I think it'll be a helpful series for you, um, uh, especially if you're in ministry um, and work in ministries where you're in kind of a position of leadership and so on. And so uh, make a special effort, if you will, to be here on Sunday nights. If for some reason you can't, then obviously all of it's going to be recorded and everything else. And uh, Again, I, uh, it's, 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 it's all about edification, and I'm not, I'm not trying to force something on anybody else, um, but if it's in the Word of God, I think, we, I think we ought to make an attempt at doing it, and uh, I'm going to explain why. So uh, we'll, we're going to start with that on Sunday nights, all right? A couple other things. Youth camp, August the 15th through the 18th. I have all of the information that you're going to need, um, and so what we're going to do is meet with all of the parents of kids eight years old and up. We did this a couple weeks ago, but I'm just, I'm gonna give you the flyers, explain a couple things in the, the camp brochure, and uh, that it's got everything that you're gonna need to bring and all of that kind of stuff in it. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk just quickly uh, after church about those things for the youth camp. And then, um, oh, last thing, uh, well, two things, kind of goes kind of goes right along with that. Um, it's, uh, I mentioned this before, and I'll mention this again in the meeting. It's $125 per camper to go to the camp. Um, our church is one of the three churches that are actually kind of hosting the camp and putting the camp on. And so um, the financial responsibility kind of falls to the three of our churches. And all of them are about the size of ours, so they're not huge churches. And so um, if you can and are, and are able and willing to give just not even necessarily sponsor somebody to go to camp, but to be able to help out with the expense of camp, um, and you don't have kids that are going or whatever else, then um, certainly we could we could use that if you want to if you if you feel the Lord's laying on your heart to give toward camp that would be a, that would be a blessing. Then the last thing is our our family VBS is this Saturday, and so we're looking forward to that. It's going to be really exciting. If you can help out on Friday night, we're going to be here on Friday night to try to set up as many of the things as we can uh, before Saturday. All right. I'm, I'm going to leave the games inside, but we're going to get everything set up, um, as many of the tents and all this stuff that we can get set up as we can. It starts at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, and so also I'd need some help on Saturday morning, maybe just bringing out some chairs and, and different things, you know. Um, don't really want to leave too many things outside if we can, if we can help it, just because there's always possibility of rain or something like that. But if you can help on Friday night or Saturday morning, around 8 o'clock Saturday morning, probably around... Uh, five o'clock, six o'clock on, on Friday night, then let me know. Um, I can certainly use the help with getting all of that set up. And uh, this is for everybody. All right, it's not just for it's not just for kids or, or or you know parents with kids. This is for everybody. So even if you're an older couple and and you haven't been at a VBS in 30 years, this is set up for everybody to be there. Okay, um, we we don't. All the games are pretty much self-running. So you don't we don't even need necessarily to have helpers that are here to run games. You're going to kind of work, and, and those of you that have been here a couple times have done it um, and know how it, how it kind of works and whatever else. It's designed for everybody in the family to be able to get involved in it. You're going to be playing games for competition, for prizes, and all of that kind of stuff, all right? So plan to come out, plan to be a part of that, and uh, certainly it's a great opportunity for us to bring people in from the community and for us to interact with them and talk with them. And, and obviously at the end of the day, our goal is to make sure that everybody we come into contact with uh, has an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that's why we do these different ministries and everything else. We're trying to get the gospel out. And, uh, you know, if they only knew, if they only knew what they're missing without Jesus Christ, and that's what we're trying to tell them. So plan to be here and be a part of that. If you can help out on Friday night and Saturday, that would be a big help as well. Two things that I'm going to mention because that we have that are actually coming up this week. But the youth meeting, um, I, we had to move that to Thursday night. 
And so um, that will be from 6.30, 8.30 on Thursday night. And then um, also on Thursday morning um, at 10 o'clock is SALT, wherever Nitton is. There you go. So for the seniors, um, and they meet here at 10 o'clock, 55 years, and, 55 years old and up. They, they come here, they do a Bible study, and then go to lunch. And so uh, anybody's welcome to be a part of that. If you need any more information, then, then just check with Brother Nitton. The 22nd is the men's morning prayer meeting. That's, that's uh, this Friday as well. So a lot of things going on this week. And there's a sign-up sheet out on the table back there for the dinner on the grounds. So what we're going to get you to sign up for, if you can, is to sign up for like a main course type thing. Um, we'll provide the, the dessert and the drinks. And so if you can bring just a dish and, and sign up back there. If you can't bring a dish, that's, that's fine as well. Sign up if you want to come and be a part of that, um, even if you can't bring something, okay? Um, but we need to have a count of how many people we have just so we know how many to buy for and all of that stuff as well. All right, I told you there was a lot of things, and there was today. So uh, let's go on to the back, Hebrews 12, 2. And you have a couple more weeks to work on memorizing this, but let's say it together. Ready? Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2. Very good. Go ahead and stand. We'll do our chorus, and for sake of time, we'll just run through it one time this morning. This is my prayer. Ready? I want to love you, Lord. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to please you, Lord. This is my prayer. Song books again and turn to page 439. We'll do our fellowship song uh, here and then we'll have a time of fellowship right after we do the first verse in the chorus. Dwelling in Beulah Land, this is a good song to sing. I know you enjoy this, so sing it out nice and loud on the first page 439. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth be set on every Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from Beulah Land. And hang on, before we go into the chorus, uh, we're only going to do one more verse, so i got to make sure you get on it right now. What does it say on the second line? Praise God. Praise God. I want to hear it nice and loud, okay? Here we go. Ready? I'm living on the mountain. Underneath the cloudless sky, praise God. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah Land. Amen. Let's have a time of fellowship.
Facebook page 439. We had to abbreviate it a little bit because the announcements went so long, and I apologize for that. I know how much you enjoy the uh, fellowship time. But page 439, we'll sing it out on the last. Don't forget, praise God. Here we go on the last. Viewing here the works of God, I sing in contemplation. salvation gladly will I tarry in land. I'm living on the mountain underneath Here we go. the cloudless sky praise God I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry oh yes I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in Beulah. Don't close your song, we're going to do the chorus one more time. That was a good praise God, but let's do the best one, all right? On the chorus one more time. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm Very drinking good. at the fountain that never shall run dry oh yes i'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for i am dwelling in beulah land very good you may be seated and we'll get the ushers to come on forward as they're coming let me remind you about this as well we have been passing out the last few saturdays these vbs flyers just to try to get as many of them out into the, uh, into the houses as we can. Jackson's going to stand at the back door and give you a little stack to, to pass out in your neighborhood this, this week, all right? We went out in our neighborhood and put them all out in the boxes and everything else and put them on doors. And our, there's a neighborhood next to us that has paper boxes and all that stuff, so that helps. If they have that in your neighborhood, then do that. If they don't, then maybe just put them in the doors. But we have flyers that are not going to be any good after next Saturday. So take them out there in your neighborhood, put them out, use it as a way to get some exercise, all right? Nitin, if you would, lead us in prayer, please. Father, we love you. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, my Jesus, for this wonderful day. Thank you for a good week, and thank you for your mercy, and thank you for bringing us all, us, uh, all of us together, my Lord. And uh, I especially pray uh, for the uh, our brother in Christ in the church who are going through uh, uh, some health issue, my Lord, and you know all their name. And we pray for all of them from our prayer list, my Lord Jesus to heal them, protect them, give them strength while they go through this all difficult time. And uh, I especially pray for this service today, be with the pastor. I also pray for his voice, uh, that uh, uh, heal him, my Lord Jesus, that uh, he should, uh, your word, my Lord, through his voice should reach our heart and uh, bless this service today, give him knowledge, wisdom, and the words to say, which uh, uh, we all need, my Lord, we all need to be changed. And uh, uh, through all what we do, we see, we hear, uh, and all through, my Lord, you should get glorified. Thank you again. Bless this service. Uh, bless the offering. And in everything we do, to glorify your name, in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen. We're going to sing about that Savior again. 133 in your hymnals. When you find it, go ahead and stand with me. This song is called Hallelujah, What a Savior. I've gotten home from work before and walked in the door and said to my wife, what a day. Right? That's how you describe your day. What a day. This is exactly the opposite, but the same phrase. What a Savior. The Bible says that if everything that was writ was written about Jesus Christ that he did on this earth, even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so we're going to sing about what a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. 133, as we start the ver first verse, children five years old and under can go to their class. Their teacher will meet them in the back. On the first. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. on verse 3. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he, full atonement, can it be, hallelujah, what a say. you're facing again I'm not sure what you're feeling or how rough this road is you trod I don't know your situation but friend I know your God if you've been saved by the King of all glory you have had Access to the throne if you've been adopted by the Prince of Peace then you are safe from all harm if you have been born again and you're covered by the blood I don't need to know your problem because friend I know Of your problem, 
but I know the signs of your God. If you've been saved by the King of all glory, you have access to the throne. If you've been adopted by the Prince of Peace, then you are safe from all harm. If you've been born again and you're covered by the blood, I don't need to know your problem because, friend, I know your God. I don't need to know your problem because, friend, I know this morning. I've got two places that I need you to turn, if you will. Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to get there in a couple minutes, but also then Ezra chapter 9. Let me give you a little bit of a background into this passage here in Jeremiah 29. The hearts of Israel had turned away from God. They had, they had uh, given up on him, essentially, and God promised them many years before that, that they would be cursed if they didn't follow him. They knew the consequences of not following God. They knew the blessings and the benefits of following God. They had both of those choices given to them, and they chose to turn away from God. And God sent Babylon to overtake and, and essentially destroy Israel as punishment. And there were false prophets, and you can read through uh, the first part of Jeremiah 29. I'm not going to take the time to do all of that this morning. But there were false prophets that were trying to, uh, verse number 9, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. But they were telling the Israelites that they could defeat Babylon. They could overcome Babylon. We just got to get up there. We got to fight. God's going to give you the victory. And God says, hey, these guys are prophesying falsely. I've, I'm telling you. That you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. You might as well start over. You might as well uh, make the best of it. These, these things, I believe, that we're going through in America very well could be God's judgment on a people who have turned away from him, who have moved away from him. And honestly, the fault lies with Christianity. We are the ones who have moved away from God. The world was never there in the first place, right? Just like God used Babylon. Babylon was a wicked place. God used Babylon as a way to judge his people. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in this nation today. But I don't believe that's the end of our story. And the Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Now remember, they're in Babylon. They're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. Now you just think about that. If you're 20 years old, by the time you come out of Babylon, if you come out of Babylon, you're 90, Right? Put yourself in, in a position of somebody who's 50 years old and going into Babylon. How old are you going to be when you come out of Babylon? 120 years, which means you're probably not coming out, right? God was saying, this is your punishment. This is what's going to happen. But even in the middle of punishment, God is telling them, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I'll bring you again into the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. See, I believe that we can see revival in America again. I, I, it's only going to happen, though, when we seek God with all of our hearts. And that's what I want to preach to you about this morning for just a few minutes. Let's pray. And we'll look at a few things in this passage and a couple others. Father, we love you. Again, we thank you for an opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you for the opportunity we have to open up your word. I pray that you'd help us to to consider it so precious. And God, that that the, the word of God would permeate our hearts this morning, that it would speak to us, that it would give us exactly what we need to give us a burden and a desire to just get back to you. To, to go deeper in our spiritual lives, to, to be closer to you than we ever have before. And God, that you'd send a revival, not just to this country, but to this church. And not to this, this church, but to my life and to the lives of those who make up this church. And God, I pray that you'd use the message in our hearts this morning in the way that only the Holy Spirit can. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Turn over to Ezra chapter 9 now. Keep your finger in, in, in Jeremiah 29. We're coming back to that. Maybe put a bookmark there or something. But see, the, the world and the Christians are becoming one. And that's the problem in America today, I believe. For Israel, God had allowed a remnant to, to return to the land, but they were only there in a symbolic sense, essentially. They, they forgot God. They intermarried with the heathen in the land. And the Bible says this in Ezra chapter 9 and verse number 1. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites. Now, these Levites were known for their separation. They were known for the ones who were set apart specifically for God's use. And even the Levites were involved in this, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their own, uh, to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Now, I know it's a lot of ites, but you know what that means? That means they followed anybody and everybody that came in and brought influence into the nation of Israel. Anybody that came along and said, hey, try this, they did it. They followed after everybody, and every one of those nations had different gods and different ways of worship and different uh, things that they worship besides God, and they followed after all of them. Verse number two, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. That's a, that's a grievous problem. The leaders were the ones who were leading the rest of the people to do those things. They were intermarrying with people who, were, who had no desire to live for God. And honestly, that's what we're seeing with the church and with Christianity in America in mingling with the world. We're marrying these two together when they were never meant to be together. Places claiming to be churches have perverted the word of God. They're moving away from the truth for the sake of convenience and for the sake of having crowds. But let's bring it closer to home. It's easy to bl blame them because we see them and we see where they're going. But what about us? We allow the world into our homes. We let our homes be exposed to the world and then we wonder what the problem is, why our children are not growing up and living for God. And I'm, I'm talking about Christianity as a whole. We haven't had a lot of kids grow up in this church yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm warning you before it happens. You want to you wanna have children that grow up and never darken the door of a church again once they leave your home, then expose them to all the things of the world. Give them everything that the world has to offer inside your home. And I can promise you, you're going to lose your kids. That's what's happening in this nation today. That's why Christianity is falling away so sharply. And that's why this nation is in the, in the condition that it's in. It's because Christianity has lost what Christianity is. Uh, if you were to go to a leper colony, to a place where you knew there was lots of disease or, or something like that, you wouldn't run, run around touching everything. You wouldn't run around trying to expose yourself to as much of the leprosy as you could. You wouldn't be running around trying to breathe in as much of the disease as you could. Now, if you had to be there, you had to be there, but you would take precautions to keep that stuff from getting all over you, right? Why do we not do that? The, the worldliness is a disease that is far worse than leprosy. And yet, we have to be in this world, but we run around touching everything we can get a hold of, grabbing everything that the world has to offer, and then we wonder why we get the same diseases that the world has. And I'm, not, I'm talking about this in a spiritual sense, not a physical sense. We, we, we don't keep ourselves separated from the world, and then we wonder why the world permeates so much of our churches, why the world permeates so much of our homes. The fault doesn't lie in the government. It's part of the devil's plan. The fault lies in the church. And what is the church made up of but families and individuals? Turn over to Isaiah 59. We've let go of the truth of the word of God. No longer does sin appear to us as sin. A lot of the things that used to be sin, because they're still in the Bible, are being accepted today. And I'm not talking about just in the world. The world has always accepted sin and embraced it. It's being accepted and embraced in our churches the Bible says this in Isaiah 59 and verse 14, and judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth the far off for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. Verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. What is a God to do? Can he allow this to go on unpunished? Can he allow it to go on unchecked within Christianity? I think a lot of the reason it's going on unchecked within Christianity, because it's not really Christianity. It's people posing as pastors, people posing as churches. And they're not really part of the family of God anyway. But we're seeing it happen amongst those who genuinely are Christians. 
If you were God and you saw the state of Christianity, would you allow it to go on unpunished? Think about that for a minute. If you were God and you saw the state of your family, would you be willing to bless your family? If you were God and you saw the things that went on in your home that you allowed in your home, would you bless it? You can't blame God when he doesn't, because I don't, in most homes, I don't think I would, I don't think I would say that God should bless them. He can't. We've allowed ourselves to be lulled to sleep by the incessant wickedness of the world. In the age when we should have been the most awake to the subtle changes that were taking place, we are ignoring them. And the changes are hardly subtle anymore. Look at the beginning of that chapter, Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. It's not God's fault. He didn't stop listening. He didn't lose his power. Verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. See, we're, con we're content to sit and watch television and movies and play video games night after night while the world is marching toward hell and toward destruction. And while our homes are marching toward hell and destruction. And while Christianity is marching toward hell and destruction. And I'm not saying that there's necessarily things wrong with those. But we're focusing on the wrong things. You realize that if we don't wake up soon, one day we're going to wake up without the freedoms that we have in this country to go preach the gospel, and you're going to miss, you're going to wish you had the advantages and the opportunities that you have now, and they're not going to be there. And then what? But there's a solution, and we find it in Jeremiah 29. Turn, over there back, turn back over there with me, if you will. I want to give you three things this morning that I hope will be a help to you. From the word of God and from what God told the Israelites when they were carried away ca into captivity by Babylon. Didn't look like a good situation, did it? Now, as of now, American Christianity has not been carried away captive anywhere. So our situation is at least better than that. But we're moving very quickly in that direction. And if we don't wake up to what's happening in Christianity, what's happening in our homes, what's happening in our church and in our churches... It's going to be too late. Here's the solution. Number one, recognize the faithfulness of God. The Bible says in verse number 11, think about the heart of God here. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. See, God didn't abandon us. We abandoned him. And I, and I just think about, think about the heart of God in this verse. God is saying, I'm not doing this because I hate you. I'm not doing this because I love the fact that you get punished by Babylon for 70 years and you lost everything that you had. I'm doing it because I love you and I've got this, this plan for your life and I've got an expected end. I'm trying to get you somewhere. I'm trying to take you where I want you to be so that I can actually bless you. I don't, I'm not doing it out of hate. I'm doing it out of love. An older couple was driving down the road together, and they were in an old station wagon they'd had for years, and they, they drove along. They had one of those big bench seats. First car that I ever owned was a 1991 Crown Victoria. That thing was a boat. It floated down the road. It didn't drive. It had a big old uh, 5.0 engine. You could squeal the tires. It wasn't an old police car, but it looked like one of those. So, I mean, the trunk was big enough to hide five bodies in it if you needed to, and you could probably put a couple in the hood, too. I mean, that's how big this car was. But it had one of those bench seats on the front. And I actually really liked that. I, I, it's not like I had people riding in it. I just liked it. I don't know why I did. But this older couple was riding in, the, in an Oldsmobile that had uh, one of those big bench seats in the front. They had the car for years. And as they drove, the wife, after some time, you know, she was, the, the husband was sitting in the driver's seat. She was sitting over in the passenger seat. And after some time, she had kind of been staring out the window a little bit. And she, she, she broke the silence. And she said, you know, remember when we used to sit right next to each other? And you used to put your arm around me, and you'd play with my hair, and you'd play with my ear, and boy, we were so close back then. And the husband looked at his wife, and he said, honey, I haven't moved. And honestly, that's the way that it is with Christianity. Why doesn't God bless America the way that he used to bless America? Why doesn't God bless Christianity the way that he used to bless Christianity? Why are we not seeing these big evangelistic campaigns where hundreds or even thousands of people are getting saved and God's blessing and God's moving and we're seeing revival in this nation? What's wrong with God? And God looks at us and he says, I haven't moved. He's always been faithful. He's always been there. We are the ones that have moved away from him. 
He didn't lose his power. He didn't lose his ear. He didn't lose his ability. We've lost our desire to be close to him. And I don't know where the separation took place between that husband and wife, but somehow she eventually started moving across that seat and ended up on her side. And she remembered what it used to be like. And I think sometimes in Christianity, we remember that same thing. We look back and we say, why don't we have that closeness? Maybe you've had a time in your life when you were close to God. If you're not as close to God today as you have been in the past, then you've moved. God hasn't moved. So often we're quick to blame God for the problems and the difficulties that he's put in our lives, that he puts us through as the reason why we're no longer close to him. But the fact is, he's right where we left him. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 9 says, Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. That's all he's waiting for. He's just waiting for us to call on him again. God's always been there. God's always been faithful. And we have to recognize that faithfulness of God. He's not out to make our life miserable. He's moving us to that expected end. His love here in this passage in Jeremiah moved him toward those Israelites as they suffered that defeat from Babylon. I came across this poem years ago, and I love it. It says, he sat by a fire of sevenfold heat as he watched by the precious ore. And closer he bent with a searching gaze as he heated it more and more. He knew he had ore that could stand the test, and he wanted the finest gold to mold as a crown for the king to wear, set with gems with price untold. So he laid our gold in the burning fire, though we fain would have said to him, Nay, and he watched the dross that we had not seen as it melted and passed away. And the gold grew brighter and yet more bright, but our eyes were so dim with tears, we saw but the fire, not the master's hand, and questioned with anxious fears. Yet our gold shone out with a richer glow as it mirrored a form above that bent o'er the fire, though unseen by us, with a look of ineffable love. Can we think that it pleases his loving heart to cause us a moment's pain? Ah, no, but he saw through the present cross the bliss of eternal gain. So he waited there with a watchful eye, with a love that is strong and sure, and his gold did not suffer a bit more heat than was needed to make it pure. He allows us to go through the bitterness of defeat and to face the challenges of an unsaved world, but only as it draws us back to himself. I tell people all the time when I go out on calls for the, the, uh, as a chaplain and, and just in talking with people in general that are going through difficult times. The reason God allows us to go through those things is to draw us back to himself. I can't give you the answer to why God lets you go through everything that, he's going through, that you're going through. But I can say this, the reason God allows you to go through the things that you're going through at the end of the day is to draw you back to himself. He's still where you left him, and he's, 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 he's constantly, and, and because he loves us so much, he'll constantly be doing it through the rest of our life, drawing us back to himself. And sometimes he has to put us through that fire. Sometimes he has to make our life hard. Sometimes he has to make it uncomfortable for us so that we'll realize that the only place we can turn is back to him. So God often, so often people kick against the preaching of the word of God. Who is he to tell me that I can't do this? Who is he to tell me uh, that I have to tithe? Who is he to tell me that I can't serve in this area of ministry because of this or that? The Bible gives us everything we need. God gives us everything we need to be successful Christians. God gives us everything we need to be pleasing to him. We're the ones who have moved away. God is faithful. When I was about five years old, we, we lived in an upstairs apartment. It's no longer there. It wasn't too long after we moved out of it that they tore it down and turned it into a parking lot for a gas station. That'll tell you how nice the house was that we lived in. But I, I think we lived there for five or six years when I was growing up. And we had this little black mutt named Tacky. No idea where we got it from. It was, I mean, it was there when I, the, the, the earliest I knew, it was the little dog was there, right? We had a fenced-in backyard. You know how funny it is, because uh, I went back, and the, that little backyard, now they, they tore the house down and made it part of the parking lot, but then behind the gas station was the backyard, and actually, the back of the gas station was actually a, like the wall for one side of our fence in our yard, and I went back there a few years ago, and I saw how tiny this yard was, and I was just, I was surprised at how small, I mean, when you're five years old, it feel like this, you know, like you're running through the fields, you know, and I go back there, I'm like, it's this little postage stamp that we used to play in, but that little backyard was fenced in, and and uh, it was our job to let the dog out every morning before we went to school. Just feed him, water him, let him run around, and then take him back in the house. 
And one day, uh, I don't remember who let him out or whatever else or how it happened, but the gate was open. And that dog ran out the back of the house, and he bolted out of that gate as fast as he could. And, of course, he's a little five-year-old, six-year-old kid. However, I don't know who was chasing him, but he didn't, we didn't get very far, and he was gone. And as hard as we looked, we drove around, we looked for that dog, never found that dog again. And I always assumed that maybe he got run over by a car or somebody else picked him up or he got eaten by a coyote or something. I don't know what happened to him, but I know this. That dog had safety. He had security. He had a meal waiting for him every time he came back in the house. He had kids that loved to play with him and everything else. And he saw that boundary broken, and he ran out of that boundary. And I don't know what happened to him, but I know this. He lost the safety and security of that fence. And if a dog could talk and go through all that process of reasoning and everything else, and I'm sure he probably couldn't, but he was probably thinking, if that gate is ever open one of these days, I'm gone. I'm getting out of here, right? And so many Christians do the same thing. We have the boundaries that are set up for us by the word of God. We have the boundaries, as I just mentioned a, a little bit ago in the announcements, of standards and convictions and things that we base on the word of God. And so, so many, especially kids that grow up in Christian homes, say, I can't wait to get away from these boundaries. As soon as I have the opportunity, when that gate's open, I'm gone, and you'll never see me again. But you know what? We need boundaries. Boundaries are what makes it so that we can enjoy ourselves, whether we realize it or not. You ever try to play a basketball game with no rules? It's not fun, because usually whoever the biggest one is out there is knocking everybody else in the head, and you can't even try to get a basket in there. It's not fun, right? You have to have rules. You have to have boundaries. That's what makes it enjoyable. You know, and you have a ref that, that calls something a foul one time, and then somebody takes an ear off, and they don't call it the next time. Where's the boundaries? What's a foul? What's not a foul? What's in bounds? What's not out of bounds? You know, somebody dribbles the ball up through the stands and comes back out the other side and makes a layup, and everybody's standing there watching him, and the ref doesn't say anything about it. That's not fun because that's not part of the rules, but now we don't know what the rules are because the ref didn't call it, right? And that's exactly what so many Christians are doing. We can't wait to get away from the boundaries of the Word of God. Can't wait to get away from the boundaries of the standards and the convictions and everything else of that church. Can't wait to get away from it. And we do get away from it and realize we lost that safety. We lost that protection. We lost what we had. And we exposed ourselves to so many things that we may didn't even, maybe didn't even know were out there. That's exactly what that dog did, and that's exactly what so many Christians do. Run away from that. They run away from that safety, that protection of the word of God. But... If we're going to see revival again, the number one, we have to recognize the faithfulness of God. God's always been there. He's still there. He's just waiting for us to come back to him. Second thing is this, and we see this in verse number 12 of Jeremiah 29, is that we have to repent of our fallen state. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 12, and, and, and mind you, these, these, this is talking to God's people. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. I don't know where this quote came from, but my dad used to say it every now and then. If we continue to do what we've always done, we'll continue to get where we've always gotten. And that's what we're doing in Christianity. I don't know why I can't get right with God. I don't know why my heart's, why God seems so far away. I don't know why I don't feel like God's using me. I don't know why I don't feel like God's blessing me. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why. You continue to do what you've always done, you're going to continue to get where you've always gotten. We can see no revival in our own lives, let alone in our country, if we don't remove the sin that floods our lives. Turn over to Isaiah 55. Again, keep your finger there in Jeremiah 29. We're coming back. But I want you to see Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 6 says this. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to come to him the first time. But if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you know that he's your Father, and you know that you're on your way to heaven, and you have that eternal security of knowing that when you die, you're going to spend eternity in heaven, hey, you need to get back to God. You need to repent of those things that are keeping your relationship from being what it can be with him. And turn back to him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What an amazing thing. God's always been there. 
I just mentioned the faithfulness of God. He's there and he's waiting and he's waiting with open arms. It's like the story of the prodigal son. The father was standing at the end of the road watching, waiting for his son to come back. And as soon as he came back, he didn't care what he had done. He embraced him and he said, this is my son and he's back. And that's the way that God treats us as his children. Look at Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. There is still hope for America. Time is running out, but there is still hope for this nation. God has not completely abandoned us, but we have to return back to him. Turn the next page or a couple pages over to Isaiah chapter 66, verse number two. The end of that verse says this, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. God is waiting for us to get right so that he can bless this nation. We have to say like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, O oh, wretched man that I am. But most of us don't want to look at ourselves like that. We, we want to look at ourselves as, oh, oh good looking man that I am. I'm, I'm a good, I, I, can, I can put it on. I know how to make people think that I'm a good Christian. Oh, look at me. I do all the things that I'm supposed to do as a Christian. Oh, Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am. And we'd consider the Apostle Paul to probably be one of the greatest Christians that's ever lived. And yet he was humble. He was contrite. He saw himself in that way. Turn over to Isaiah 51. I told you we had a lot of verses this morning. We don't have too many more left. But I want you to see this because this is the story of David. David, a man after God's own heart, the Bible calls him, made a grievous mistake. A sin. He sinned grievously before God. He committed adultery, and then he committed murder right after that adultery. And you would think that a man like that, God could never use him again. But David didn't let it stay that way. In verse number one, he said this of Psalm 51, verse number one. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. David wasn't making excuses for his sin. David saw the, the horrific deed that he had committed, and it was right in front of his eyes, and he said, God, you're a merciful God, and I'm appealing to that mercy. Please forgive me. I can't live like this anymore. That sin is just festering, and I've got to get it out. Verse number seven, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 16, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. See, when we realize the state we're in, like Israel had to recognize that their city was broken down, that they had been carried away in captivity, and we can begin to make those changes and come back to God. And the last thing is this, back over in Jeremiah 29. Number one, we have to recognize the faithfulness of God. Number two, we have to repent of our fallen state. And number three, we have to renew our commitment to God. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Revival is not going to come with half-heartedness. Jeremiah 29, verse 13, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with, what's that little word? All. All, all your heart. Doesn't say with part of it. Doesn't say with little pieces of it. It says with all your heart. Isaiah chapter 64. Turn over there, if you will. Isaiah chapter 64. This is, this is the prayer that we need to, to pray if we're going to see God do anything. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse number 1. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Verse 4, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Could you imagine that? 
That means that we cannot even comprehend what, want, what God wants to do through us if we would just be willing to get right with him. You think about some of the people that God has greatly used over the past. D.L. Moody, Charles Spurgeon, Billy Sunday, uh, uh, so many other names that we could bring up that God has greatly used to bring about revivals in this nation. And yet God says there in that passage, since the beginning of the world, we haven't heard, seen, or perceive what God can do with somebody that is totally given over to him. You know, D.L. Moody, at the beginning of his ministry, as he, you know, in one of his messages, he said, the world has yet to see what God can do with one man who has totally surrendered to him. And then D.L. Moody was used by God in a great way to touch two continents. He touched England and he touched, or, or two countries, essentially. He touched England and he touched the United States of America. God greatly used him in both places, and, and, and I, I think that it's estimated that, that D.L. Moody was able to lead, through his preaching and everything else, around a million people to Jesus Christ. A million. And near the end of his ministry, D.L. Moody said the exact same thing that he said at the beginning. The world has yet to see what God can do with one man who is completely surrendered to him. Could you imagine what God wants to do with us? Can you imagine how God wants to use us if we would just... Renew our commitment to him. Get back to being right with him. Charles Spurgeon said this, Men seek after gold as if they had a thousand hearts, but they seek after grace as if their heart were cut in a thousand pieces and only one solitary thousandth part of it went after the blessing. That's the way we live in American Christianity today. Our hearts are in a thousand places and we give God one of those little thousand pieces and say, all right, God, this is yours. This is the part you can have. This is the part that I'm going to use to seek you with. No, God says, I want all your heart. You have to seek me with all your heart if you want me to bless you. He promised them that their exile would be followed by a restoration, but only as that exile pushed them toward God. Just because you go through a difficult time does not mean that God is automatically going to bless you when you come out the other side. God blesses your life. God helps you. You will come forth as gold if you allow God to purify you through that trial. Just because you go through something difficult does not mean that God's going to bless you. God uses those difficulties and those trials to push you toward himself and to help purify you and to help cleanse you. You should be better. You should be different when you come out the other side. God may be waiting to see how we respond in that time of trial. Think about the story of Gideon. I don't have time to, to read the whole passage, but he started with 32,000 men, which was a very small number compared to the number of men in the Midianite army. And God said, you have way too many men. 32,000, that's way too many. Too many pretending to be part of the Lord's army. And so Gideon, he told him to, God told Gideon to send all of those home who were afraid. And 22,000 of them left. I'm afraid, I can't fight against these Midianites. 22,000 leave and go home. Now there's 10,000. You can imagine Gideon. We didn't have anywhere close to enough men before. Now I have only a third of what I had before. 10,000 men? How am I supposed to go up against this army? He told them to take a rest. Uh, told them to take the rest of them down to the water and to drink. And those who lapped it up like a dog, send them home. And 9,700 stuck their heads down there and lapped the water up like a dog. And he got left with 300 men. Do you know what God did with those 300? He gave them a victory unlike anything they had ever seen. Because they defeated an army that was probably a hundred times bigger than their army, and God did it. And they knew God did it. And they didn't even have to pull out a weapon. They pulled out pitchers, and they rattled them and yelled. That's all God, because they did it in God's way. And, they, and, and the people who, who were pretending to be soldiers were sent home, and they were left with the ones who were genuinely part of the Lord's army. God's looking for the faithful who are willing to step out of the crowd and face that enemy head on. Not afraid of what the world says. Prepared unto the day of battle to accomplish some great things for God. God whittled that army down to such a small size so that there was no way that they could say it was them. It's not like that army of 300 went out and every one of them slew 15 guys. They didn't kill any of them. God did all of it for them. There was no way that they could say it was them. It was none of them and all of God. And until we get to that point, we're never going to see revival. So many churches are trying to manufacture a revival. A revival cannot be manufactured. It has to be God sent. God has to do it. We're whittled way down in numbers. Christianity is shrinking. 
a whole lot less of us than there were 50 years ago. God's looking for faithful soldiers who are going to abandon all to him, completely surrender to his will and his way to accomplish some great things that he can get the credit for, not us. You see, if there's something else there, then God doesn't have our whole heart. Why don't we seek after God the same way that we seek after a promotion at work? Why don't we seek after God the same way that we seek after money? Why don't we seek after God the same way that we seek after fame? Turn over to one last passage, Habakkuk. I'd take you a few hours to get there, so I'll give you some time. Habakkuk chapter 3. While you're turning over there, I want to read you this quote from Vance Havner. He was a well-known preacher, been dead for years now, but he said this. The greatest need of America is old-fashioned, heaven-born, God-sent revival. Throughout the history of the church, when the clouds have hung the lowest, when sin has seemed blackest and faith has seemed weakest, there have always been a faithful few who have not sold out to the devil or bowed the knee to Baal, who have feared the Lord and thought upon his name and have not forsaken the assembling of themselves together. These have besought the Lord to revive his work in the midst of the years and in the midst of fears and tears and in wrath to remember mercy. God has always answered such supplication, filling each heart with his love, rekindling each soul with his fire from above. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse number 2 says this, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. One of the greatest college football players that ever lived was George Gipp. He played for Notre Dame from 1917 to 1920. And I don't know how many people would even know about him had it not been for the fact that Ronald Reagan, when he was still an actor, made a movie about George Gipp. But he went to Notre Dame intending to play baseball, but he was recruited by Newt Rockney to play football. And he was, and still is considered today, one of the most versatile players because he played halfback, he played quarterback, and he played punter. And his career marked, I had to write these down because I wouldn't remember them, but his 2,341 rushing yards lasted almost 60 years, his record that he set for that. He threw for 1,789 yards, scored 21 touchdowns, averaged 38 yards a punt, caught five interceptions, had 14 yards per punt return, 22 yards per kick return in four seasons. That was his average. He still holds the record at Notre Dame for average yards per rush, 8.1 for a season. Holds the record for career average yards per play of total offense, career average yards per game of total offense. May not mean a whole lot to you, but just to say that George Gipps set a lot of records that, that even 100 years later are not broken. But just days after he led Notre Dame to a victory over Northwestern, he was out giving some punting lessons in some cold weather, and he caught strep throat. Because back in that time, they didn't have any cure for step, strep throat. He ended up dying from it at the age of 25. But as he lay in that hospital bed, Newt Rockney, the coach at Notre Dame, came in to see him. And this is kind of immortalized by Ronald Reagan as he lay there in that hospital bed. George Gipp turned to Newt Rockney and he said, I've got to go, Rock. It's all right. I'm not afraid. Sometime, Rock, when the team is up against it, when things are wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, ask them to go in there with all they've got and win one for the Gipper. Maybe you recognize that. Go out and win one for the Gipper. He didn't say when things are bad, go in there and give up and roll over. He told him, give it all they've got. Win, win one for him. We have so much at stake in Christianity our children, our future, Christianity itself. Let's go out and conquer instead of living defeated. Don't you get tired of living a defeated life? Don't you get tired of always losing the battle to sin? Don't you get tired of always losing the battle to the devil? I certainly believe that God's not done with us yet. We, we, we have to feel not that we may have revival, but that we must have revival. If you look back over the course of history, it was the individual that God used to spark revival. I believe that this period in American history is either going to be is going to mark either the greatest feat, defeat or the greatest victory that Christianity has ever known. We're in the middle of that right now, and it could go either way. It all depends on what we're going to do with it. Are we going to get right with God? Are we going to recognize the faithfulness of God? Recognize that God has always been there and that it's us that's moved away from him? 
We're going to repent of our fallen state. We're going to repent of those sins that are keeping us back from being what God wants us to be. And are we going to renew our commitment to God? Because honestly, that's the only way that we're going to see a revival in this nation. Whether we run to God or run away from God will be the deciding factor in the struggle. And it's going to determine if America lives or dies. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We're losing that very quickly. And if we don't see a revival in this nation, they're not even going to know who God is. And this nation is gone. Whether America lives or dies depends on us, whether or not we're going to allow God to really send a revival to our hearts. Not just Christianity, not just the churches, not just our church, but to me. Do I really want to see revival? Do you really want to see revival? Because that's what it's going to take if we're going to see God do something in this nation again. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Again, we thank you for your goodness. I thank you for an opportunity that we see in the word of God so often that you, you want, you want to send revival. You want to bless us. You want to give us something that we, have, we can't even comprehend. But so few of us are willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary to get it. And I'm not saying that it's easy. But God, you have to give us the strength. You have to give us the help. And I know you want to, so I pray that you'd help us to throw it all on you. Pray that you'd help us to, to throw ourselves completely on you. That we'd get right with you. That we'd renew our commitment to living for you. And that at least in this church, not, not for pride's sake, not for anything else other than to be able to look at you and say, God, I did my best to live for you. I did my best to live right before you. I did my best to live humbly before you. I pray that every single one of us in this auditorium this morning would be able to say that. And when we can't and where we can't, then God, I pray that you give us the boldness and the courage to change what we need to change so that we can. Well, thank you for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand at your seat through the heads bowed and your eyes closed. My inclination is that God might have laid something specific on your heart this morning. I didn't, I was not very specific this morning with specific sins or things like that. But that's the Holy Spirit's job, not mine. I don't know what you're dealing with in your private life. You do. And God does. What we need is the courage and the boldness to come and get it right with Him. Well, everybody's going to look at me and think that I got all these problems and, hey, does it matter what you think and other people think, or does it matter what God thinks? That's what our concern ought to be. So as the piano plays this morning, if God's spoken to your heart, you come and get it right with him. Let this be, let this be the first step in moving back toward where you left it. As the piano plays, you come. The invitation's open. Lord, I surrender all, let revival begin in me. That's the song that she's playing. Can you say that?